admitted to striking the pedestrian with his car because he had a political argument with the pedestrian and believed the pedestrian was calling people to come get him, unquote, according to a probable cause document filed in court. Brant was charged with vehicular homicide and leaving the scene of an accident. He told the 911 dispatcher that Ellingson was part of a Republican extremist group. North Dakota State Patrol has said they have found no evidence supporting this claim, which you could say is a hefty amount of projection, since Brandt is clearly the one with the extremist views and actions. After the crash, Brandt reportedly told police he had been drinking and was found to have a blood alcohol level of .08, the maximum legal limit. He was freed on a $50,000 bond after being charged with criminal vehicular homicide and leaving the scene of a crash involving death. Ellingson's mother said that her son tried to call her twice, the first time to ask her if she knew who Brant was, and the second to tell her that Brant was chasing him. Sadly, of course, his mother never spoke to him after that second call. Taylor's parents believe that their son and Brant might have been acquainted with one another, but hadn't met prior to the encounter. Obviously, this is an ongoing investigation, and further charges may be added to this. And we will likely learn more about the nature of the relationship between the 41 and 18 year old. But what we do seem to know at this point is that Brandt's claims about Ellingson are false. He was not a Republican extremist, but this is also a predictable alibi for Brandt. Whatever political extremism he had in his own heart is likely the reason he tracked Ellingson down and mowed him down. This could be something as simple as apparel Ellingson might have worn at that time to something that was said if the two were jawing, if that happened, or it might be something less innocuous than any of those reasons. But it does seem that Brant had a vendetta against Ellingson because this is a small town in North Dakota. Chances are that people are acquainted even though they might not really know one another. For instance, here in Florida, I see boats driving down the intercoastal with Trump and DeSantis flags all over them. They are certainly expressing their First Amendment right. But of course, this can be the, to the dismay of an opposing viewpoint. The difference is, when does expressing your First Amendment right turn into harming another individual? And we have to take this one isolated event in context with the larger political climate and even Joe Biden's recent speech which I will get into. The closest similar example that I can find would be Charlottesville, Virginia, where in 2017, self-proclaimed neo-Nazi James Fields drove his car into a crowd of protesters, killing Heather Heyer. He pled guilty to 20 hate crimes. You probably remember the relentless amount of media attention that this particular event got as they tried to lay this crime at the feet of Donald Trump whom they feel inflamed tensions and encouraged political violence. The same would be true regarding the relentless coverage of January 6th, in which they tried to tie Trump's speech that day, in which he used the words peacefully and patriotically protest to the breach of the Capitol, which left more Trump supporters dead than anyone else. The vast majority of the protesters that day acted in a very normal way, away from any confrontation. I think it's always important to provide context to each incident because the media will often present a narrative rather than facts. Remember how incorrect they were about Nick Sandman and Jesse Smollett? They jumped to conclusions based upon confirmation bias. But let's not forget that in June of 2017 that James Hodgkinson, a left-wing activist, used an assault weapon to open fire on Republicans playing in a congressional softball game in Alexandria, Virginia, which wounded congressmen such as Steve Scalise and Roger Williams, whom I've interviewed before. It was considered an act of terrorism. Now, you won't hear much from the media about that. And sadly, the media has been rather silent regarding coverage of the killing of Taylor Ellingson. Why is that? Why is it that when one side of the political spectrum commits violence, every outlet talks about it? But when someone from the other side does it, it gets little coverage. Is that the commitment 
to journalistic integrity that is supposed to be taught in newsrooms across America? At a recent rally, former President Trump spoke about this. North Carolina should be a sanctuary for law-abiding Americans, not criminal aliens. We are going to make America great again, and our first task is to make America safe again, right? Safe. Just recently, a young 18-year-old man from North Dakota, I'm sure you read this over the last few days, named Taylor Ellenson, a young man so handsome, so handsome, beautiful, 18 years old, was targeted and killed, run down in cold blood with an SUV by a radical left maniac. He's a radical left stupid person simply because he was a Republican and he was so proud of being a Republican. And this guy ran him down. And not one mainstream media network has even mentioned this horrible crime. Think of it. Now think of it the other way. Think of it the other way. Supposing a MAGA person ran down somebody on the other side, it would be the biggest story you've ever seen. It's a disgrace. You people should be ashamed of yourselves. You should be ashamed of yourself. And our hearts go out to the parents and the friends. This young boy, this was a young man, a wonderful, with a great future. MSNBC and the New York Times have not run a single story about Ellenson's murder. The Washington Post ran one small article about the North Dakota Attorney General condemning it, and CNN ran one singular piece. So Trump is right. The media across this country should be ashamed of themselves. The kid was 18 years old. He had his whole life ahead of him, and he gets mowed down by a fanatical political extremist who accused the victim himself of being an extremist. And North Dakota is not exactly the crime-infested place like Chicago is or Memphis. A family friend of Ellingson's said that Taylor was, quote, what everyone would want when they have a baby. Taylor was the all-American boy. He liked to hunt, golf, anything. He was just a good 18-year-old kid. Ellingson graduated from Carrington High School last spring and was going to school to be an ultrasound technician. He was described as an autocross enthusiast who was quiet and shy but someone that everyone looked up to in the community. And for that, the community in this small town in North Dakota is grieving and responding with support. And thus far, the North Dakota State Patrol cannot find any evidence that Grant and Ellingson had any political dispute. The fact that they can't find any evidence of that tells me that Grant, in many ways, was stalking Ellingson for political reasons. I don't want to speculate, but something about Ellingson, whether it was anything that he said or expressed that was Republican in nature, or perhaps just that he was a good all-American kid with a bright future that caused a deranged grant, drunk on both alcohol and political ideology, to take this teenager's life. Even though police are not finding much credibility to Brandt's account, we do have his motive. It was political in nature. Brandt's criminal history consists of arrests for unlawful possession of alcohol and fleeing a peace officer on foot in October of 2006, as well as being arrested for a DUI with actual physical control in February 2002, according to records. Four of Brandt's neighbors who spoke under the condition of anonymity said that they don't believe the incident was motivated by politics, but rather had something to do with mental health problems. So it's likely that his criminal defense attorneys will plead insanity. His family already seems to be hinting at mental illness, which could be part of it for sure. But when you look at the media coverage, they will try to cover up the political aspect of the motive. Everyone who kills someone based on ideology could cop out as mentally ill or insane. But this is why I devote today's subject to the cost of political extremism, because it doesn't take very much, apparently, to go from ideological extremism to violence. When you look at terrorist organizations like Al-Qaeda, Hamas, Hezbollah, and the Taliban, are they all mentally ill? Or do they harbor such a zealotry of belief that it motivates them to kill those who don't think the way that they do? 
I actually think this is a very fair comparison to make because they have been indoctrinated. They have a certain interpretation of the Quran that leads them to a violent path. In the same way, Americans who adopt a similar belief system can be motivated to violence. But let's be clear about where Joe Biden stands on this issue. He said this recently, even though his backdrop has been likened to the Third Reich or the CCP. Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans represent an extremism that threatens the very foundations of our republic. Now, I want to be very clear, very clear up front. <clears throat> not every Republican, not even the majority of Republicans are MAGA Republicans. Not every Republican embraces their extreme ideology. I know because I've been able to work with these mainstream Republicans. But there's no question that the Republican Party today is dominated, driven, and intimidated by Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans. And that is a threat to this country. These are hard things. But I'm an American president, not a president of red America, blue America, but of all America. And I believe it's my duty, my duty to level with you, to tell the truth, no matter how difficult, no matter how painful. And here, in my view, is what is true. MAGA Republicans do not respect the Constitution. They do not believe in the rule of law. They do not recognize the will of the people. They refuse to accept the results of a free election. So in this speech, Biden tries to warn Americans of political extremism, but he believes it can only come through one source, MAGA Trump Republicans. When a president says this, it tells everyone that only one group or one ideology can possibly be extremist. Not the guy who shot up the Republicans at the congressional softball game. Hi, I'm Smokey Bear, and I'm a 